um, we say the graph is fine if for any edge E and all natural numbers, there are finitely many circuits of length n. So in case you're confused about what I mean by a circuit, a circuit is um, just an embedded loop. So you want it not to sort of self-intersect or run over the same edge again and again. And so let me give you some, some examples. So examples, let's just take sort of a single vertex and then have a, a tree going off it in many different ways. In fact, in particular, you should pretend even though I cannot draw on a tablet or a chalkboard infinitely many branches coming off this point. As long as it's sort of a tree like this, that's a fine graph, even if it was, were an infinite valence vertex. And so this is sort of the idea is that we're kind of trying to generalize this notion of sort of local finiteness. This fineness is going to be a, a way of getting some sort of local finiteness, but not strictly local finiteness. Um, here's something that's not fine. And we'll see this come back later. So if I take this and I sort of, if I take a single edge like this and I put, just keep repeating over and over and over and over, then I have you know, a ton of different loops that go through this particular edge. And that's not fine because you can get infinitely many things that go through this, this first edge that I drew down here. All right, so what do we, other than the fact that this is a fun definition, what do we actually use this for? So um, definition, let's suppose G acts on a delta hyperbolic graph. Uh, gamma, and let's suppose stabilizers, oh, sorry, I want to suppose the edge stabilizers are finite. And also importantly, there exist finitely many orbits of edges. Um, so if this graph happens to be fine, and we take a collection of, it's going to be a finite collection of conjugacy representatives for all infinite vertex stabilizers. Then we say, GP is a relatively hyperbolic pair. So you have this group, it's acting on this delta hyperbolic graph, but it's, um, it's only fine. It's not necessarily locally finite and you might miss out on sort of the properness, but you do have this finite, this is something that's sort of like being co-compact. You have this finitely many orbits of edge and edge stabilizers being finite. So this is, this is kind of an important condition it has uh, wreaked havoc in the past when people have conveniently forgot the parts about there being finitely many orbits of edge and things. So do be aware that this is slightly technical. Let me give you a simple example of such an item. So let's say G acts on a tree, again, without inversions, and has finite edge stabilizers. And plus we need, uh, plus we need, uh, let's call this a tree T. We want the, plus we want a finite quotient. So basically what that says is that your group is going to split over some finite number of finite edge groups and you get some finite graph of groups splitting for your group. And then in this case, G is, is um, 
hyperbolic rel some conjugacy representatives for the vertex stabilizers. I interrupt for a second to see if I've got these definitions right. It, it seems that what you're saying is that yet something like the complete graph on countably many vertices it fails to be fine because you there are infinitely many triangles containing any given edge. That would be correct. But if you took, say, an infinite wedge of triangles, so take an infinite collection of disjoint triangles, identify one vertex in, in all the triangles, that wouldn't have any problem with triangles because each edge belongs to a single triangle. Now it still wouldn't be fine because you each edge belongs to infinitely many hexagons. Just take its triangle and any of the other triangles. I thought it would be, but it would, but you wouldn't have any problem with triangles. That's right. But if you took an, an infinite wedge of a triangle, a square, a pentagon, a hexagon, and so on, that would be fine, but it would, um, that would be fine, but it would, even though it's not locally finite. You know that that, that that you know the the point in common has infinitely many edges coming into it, but there's only finitely many ways to get an end gone because yeah. all of the loops that are bigger than the end gone don't count. That's right. And you, even so, if it's a wedge, then you know, this so coming across a triangle and then coming back to this point in common that you no longer have a circuit beyond that. Right. So I think even if you take the infinitely many wedges of tri in infinitely a wedge of infinitely many triangles, there are, yeah, I guess that fails to be fine because they're infinite. No, because if I take one of these edges on the triangle in order to make a longer circuit, anything longer, you still have to come to come through this edge. Um, in order to come through this edge, you have to go through this triangle. And once you pass through this vertex, you can't be part of any other loop. So you can't do something like go like this and then go around another triangle because you came through this point and then oh, now oh, you're no so, longer so a circuit. circuit. So circuits have to be simple circuits. They, yeah. The concatenation of two circuits doesn't count as a circuit. No. Okay, so the wedge of triangles is fine. Is fine, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I can't really hear you. You're sort of cracking out. Okay, there's a problem with my system, so uh, don't worry. If do you want to type it in the chat, I can read the chat if you'd like. Okay, very good. So you know, I've introduced this and we've introduced some very simple example, but you might wonder like, how would you come up with the, how would you construct these fine hyperbolic graphs and where do they come up in nature? So where do we get these naturally? So let's look at another example. So let's consider pi one of, here's my torus. And then I'm going to just wedge on a circle. So we get something that's isomorphic to Z2 star Z. And if we kind of unwind this and go up to the universal cover, what you're going to get is you're going to get something that looks like a tree of flats. So I don't need to draw. You can kind of imagine each of the integer lattice points has something going up and down, going to another flat. Here's another flat. And you have tons of these edges coming out. I guess it would have been ideal if I drew a different color to have them look like the circle, um, but too late now. I guess we can go like this. So this is this is cartoon of the universal cover. And I should just make clear that this goes on and on and on and on. So at each of the integer lattice points, there's lots and lots, of, there's ways out to other flats. But there's sort of a there's a tree-like structure here, and you can imagine that if we sort of take the one skeleton, 
you take the one skeleton and cone off each of the flats, you get something you get something that is coarsely a tree. So sort of coning off the flats turns them into being flat things and now they're a finite diameter and you sort of eliminated the obstacles to the space being hyperbolic. So this is gives you some sort of natural hyperbolic space that your group is going to act on in some very natural way. And in particular, what this sort of construction illustrates is the notion of this kind of coned off Cayley graph. So what you're doing is you're going to take, so here's my, here's my flat part corresponding to one of these conjugates of z squared or coset of z squared is what it really is in the Cayley graph. Each of the flats comes from a coset of the z squared that comes from your fundamental group of your torus. And then what you do is you just put a cone point above it. And now you've built something that's finite diameter. So from a coarse perspective, you've basically knocked out this flat and you no longer have an obstruction to being hyperbolic. So this kind of motivates where you get this, where you can find these examples in nature is you take some sort of group and you have some natural space that acts on it. So it's Cayley graph and then you can cone off the parts that are flat and hopefully you end up with something that's going to be delta hyperbolic. But of course, the downside of this is that you have introduced this vertex of infinite valence. So this, if you had proper and co-compact action, then you have a hyperbolic group. But this is not hyperbolic, clearly, because it has a z squared in it. So, um, so let's say, so the general construction is given g and a collection of infinite subgroups. P, and a, I should say a finite, infinite subgroups, um, we can make the coned off Cayley graph by taking some Cayley graph for G and coning off all cosets of the form GP, where P is in my collection of distinguished subgroups. So in the example above, you're coning off, so you have your Z squared coming from the fundamental group of that torus, and you're coning off all the cosets that come from that torus. Those are where your flats are coming from. Now, you need to be a little bit sort of careful to get something useful. So when uh, GP has a, has a delta hyperbolic coned off Cayley graph that is also fine, then we say that GP is going to be relatively hyperbolic. So what you kind of, you know, why, why this fineness condition, um, why not just delta hyperbolic? So let me give you an example of something that, that sort of is very bad. So the sort of canonical non-hyperbolic example is Z squared. And so, so let's look at um, Z squared. And you might sort of suspect that I have this as A, B. And what you say to me here, I draw, I draw it like this, and then we'll give, say this sort of pattern like this. And we have um, these ones represent cosets of the group generated by B. 
And you could imagine that if I kind of coarsely collapse these to points, cone them off, then we get something that coarsely looks like a line. But the problem with this, this sort of situation is that um, what happens, you can do things like you can go from here and then these, these cosets, they fellow travel each other for very long distances. So you can go sort of way up here and then come around and you get these like tons of elaborate bygones and that's not really very good for being hyperbolic. This is sort of, you're not going to get that sort of behavior where, where the geometry is going to work out nicely. So you, the sort of the moral of the story is that you really don't want C squared to be relatively hyperbolic relative to sort of one of the generating elements or the subgroup generated by one of the relative generating elements. Okay, so this looks like a, a scheme that we could maybe exploit for some usefulness, but there are sort of other issues that you might ask that I've kind of raised already. So we might, we might want to settle for this, but why should we not necessarily settle for this single, singular conception of relatively hyperbolic? Uh, so things that could go wrong. One is obviously these spaces are not locally finite. In particular, they're not proper. So I think Benjamin Barrett talked a little bit about the boundary of a hyperbolic group. And one of the things that's nice about a hyperbolic group is that you can build this canonical notion of boundary and you get an equivariant homeomorphism. So sort of you take the Cayley graph of your hyperbolic group, you take this boundary construction and if you sort of mess with the Cayley graph and you get a different generating set and whatnot, you might end up with sort of a different space, but the boundary is the same up to homeomorphism. But in order to kind of do all that mechanism, you really need this local finite and this properness. You need properness as a, a condition to sort of be able to do all the nice Arzela Scoli type arguments. So what you would want to do in order to get a reasonable notion of boundary for a relatively hyperbolic group, you kind of don't necessarily want to start with this because the visual boundary isn't really going to tell you that all that much about the geometry in some invariant fashion. Um, another sort of point that I don't think I'll have a huge amount of time to go into, but I might talk a little bit more about in my next talk, is sort of relative quasi-convexity and sort of understanding which subgroups uh, respect the, geo the relatively hyperbolic geometry. And this can be kind of hard to understand if by looking at the coned off Cayley graph, it becomes sort of more easy to understand if you look at this cusp space construction, which I'll talk about and the sort of more dynamical perspective that I'll touch on as well. Um, I should note, it just co comes to me now that I keep meaning to say something about it. And I haven't, for our purposes, you should, you should assume that G is finitely generated when I'm talking, there are some ways to deal with this. In particular, many of these theories can sort of be extended to things where it's not finitely generated, or you could have a finitely finite relative generation where you have some generating set plus the per, your intended p's, and that could be enough to do most of this theory. And you can also look at infinitely generated groups, but it sort of becomes slightly more complicated when you're trying to manage the equivalence of all these different definitions if you're not in the finitely generated setting. So if you're sort of interested in this, I suggest that you take a look at Hriska's survey on relative hyperbolicity, and he'll sort of point out all the right points where you need to care about whether things are finitely generated or not, and when you can go into more detail. Um, hey, Teddy, um, I'm curious about the example of Z square star Z. You yes, above. Yes. Uh, sure. For the graph you created, once you cone off, is the graph still fine? It looks not fine to me. It is, it's definitely fine. Um, thinking of how to prove it, that's tricky. Um, why should we expect it to be fine? Uh, the, the quick, dirty answer that I have for you is that being fine is equivalent to bounded coset penetration. Um, and so sort of if you have 
sort of the idea that you have some finiteness of geodesics, like you can track whether sort of a quasi geodesic is determined by what trajectory it takes through the flats, mm -hmm. as long as you have, or I should say quasi geodesics without backtracking. And you can sort of, if you look in Bowditch's paper, you can, there are sort of many different, um, Bowditch's paper on relatively hyperbolic groups is sort of many different conceptions of what, how you can think of fine. Um, let me see. Well, if can... well but if you, you, you fix say a blue edge over here, it seems that there are lots and lots of circles that you can create using the red grid. That's right. There are lots of circuits, but if you specify um, a particular length, oh, uh, oh okay. yeah, yeah, for, yeah, okay. for each length, length, there are only okay. finitely many circuits. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, okay. That's I guess that's okay. where I got confused. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry if I <laughs> misinterpreted your question as being more complicated. After collapse, so you're not actually collapsing the flats to points. I'm kind of lying about that. You're only doing it in the coarse sense. What you're actually doing is you're coning the flats off by adding a point above the flat and then going to each of the integer lattice points on the flats. And that from a, the perspective, now the distance between any of these lattice points is two. And so, so coarsely that flat becomes a point when you're coning off, but you're not actually making them into points. So there are legitimate loops in this graph. So like, for example, just to give you an idea, here's a, here's a legitimate loop. You come down this edge, you go over one edge, and then you come back up to the cone point. All right, so uh, I'll move on if there are no other questions. Actually, and, could, could oh, you, yeah. uh, but what was the point about the next example? You're saying that if you, if you cone off just the, um, you know, the vertical cosets there. Um, to down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah this one, um, yeah. You're saying that that does not give a fine graph? This, this does not give a fine graph because it looks like the, so if you cone off just the vertical lines, you'll get something that looks kind of like, um, you'll get something that looks like the first example that I drew of something that's not fine. Up here, you get sort of this picture. You can go, you can go up one of the vertical bars at a cost of distance two, because you've coned off the vertical bar. Right. And now you can go across to the next vertical bar, and then come down at distance two, and then go through an edge on, say, the x-axis. Okay. I guess I'm confused about what the difference is between that picture and the and the previous. Word. Maybe let's, let's look. so in this picture here, let me sort of augment this picture. So you can imagine that if I coned off one of these vertical bars going from here to, to you can go all the way as far up the page as you want, but that only costs distance two when the vertical bar is coned off because there's a, you go up to the cone point and then back down way up here. Right. And now you can go over one in the grid. Right. And now you can come down this other vert, oh, and now you come down this other grid in the vertical bar. And now you have a length five loop that goes through, or you have a length six loop that goes through this edge. And you can do this and you can go arbitrarily, you get infinitely many length, oh. five, length six loops. Oh, I see. Okay, the point that is edge. the two vertical paths have a different cone point. Is that That's the right. point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you, you cone so you're off. Not, yeah. yeah. You're not allowed to do that in the other one because they all have the same cone point. They all have the same cone point. That's right. OK. OK, yeah. thanks. Yeah. OK, so um, where we were, thanks for stopping me and making me go through things slowly. Um, yeah, that, that's a good point. Thanks. Um, so the problem with this conception of working with this is that we don't have local finiteness. And this doesn't really give us a canonical way to build the boundary. So let me sort of give you a, a potential trick to make things more proper. And the idea is to still sort of find ways to remove things like flats and 
sort of except without doing this crude point where you cone off to this infinite point. And so we're going to basically introduce some geometric distortion. So this is a, a more general construction. I think the first example of something like this is due to Cannon and Cooper, but you'll see um, sort of as it relates to relative hyperbolicity, one of the spots you can see it is in Groves and Manning's paper on relative hyperbolicity and Dane filling. So let's let sigma be a graph and a combinatorial horrible over, oops, what's happening with my pencil? A combinatorial horrible over sigma is constructed by taking um, V of sigma cross zero union the natural numbers as vertices. So what you're basically going to do is you're going to take a sigma and then you're going to make a tower of sigmas sitting over it and then add edges. Um, you want one from V comma I, so from vertex at level I to V comma I plus one. And this is not a directed graph, but it's more convenient to think of it like that. Um, and also from V comma N to W comma N, exactly when D of V and W is less than or equal to two to the N. So to give you an idea of what's going on, let's look at sort of a simple picture. Let's say I start with a, a line, which is divvied up in the usual way into some sort of graph. I take an infinite line. Basically what I do is I create multiple different copies of the line. And by going, by going up one, now we'll have, oops, I should have drawn more of these. So you can go up one, two. So now you'll have an edge between here and here, of course, because that was for distance one, but now you get also a shortcut of length two, or you, it's now distance one between those points that were originally distance two apart. And you can do the this sort of analogously keep going and I won't keep drawing because I'll be drawing all day. But up here you get sort of the, the usual distances, but now you get shortcuts between this point is distance four from that one. So there's an edge of length one there. So basically by, by going up this direction, you get sort of a exponential or you could say logarithmic decrease in how far it's going to take to go across. So going up sort of rewards you in the sense that you can now go zoom across this picture very quickly. And so this is sort of like coning off, but you're sort of introducing an exponential distortion to the metric. Um, and so the point is this construction always gives you something something hyperbolic. Offhand, I think it's something like it's going to be 20 hyperbolic or something like that. So it doesn't matter what you started with, but basically you've introduced this exponential distortion and you get something that's hyperbolic. And this this sort of picture, the metric that you get on this, this should coarsely look like the upper half plane model for H2. So that, that's one way to, to look at this. Okay, so one one thing you could imagine that you could do, so construction, you can make the sort of cusp space or at least the, the one skeleton thereof. There are situations where you wanna, might actually wanna add sort of two simplices to your combinatorial horribles that I won't go into because I'm not that interested in that at the moment. Um, so this cusp space, take the Cayley graph And where before what we were doing is we were coning off the, the flat parts or the sort of our desired group of carefully chosen group of subgroups. So for G plus the collection uh, P, this is gonna be the finite collection. 
And what we're going to do is glue on combinatorial horror balls uh, to each full subgraph corresponding to um, cosets GP. So basically, in this example, we took the, the line and then we built the combinatorial horrible. And at level zero, there's a natural copy of the line inside the combinatorial horrible. So what you can basically do is take the cosets and then you can put these combinatorial horribles on top of the cosets. And now you've basically, you've basically sort of cut out the flat parts. You've now made them sort of hyperbolic in the tree of flats example, because now you can sort of, you're no longer this, this flat thing now has some sort of more hyperbolic like feature and distances. And you can test relative hyperbolicity and this is, so should be known that this is equivalent. Um, the pair, the pair GP is relatively hyperbolic in the sense above exactly when this cusp space is hyperbolic. So for example, you should see um, Groves Manning relatively hyperbolic Dane filling for that. So this is another way to, to tell that you have something that is a relatively hyperbolic pair. So you might ask, what's, what's the advantage? Um, this space is locally finite. Um, which makes it better. And you also get this boundary you get a, you get a canonical notion of boundary out of it. And so in particular, you can actually take a, a more general perspective on this, um, which is due in part to Bodich and Yaman. Um, so so definition. Um, Let's let G act properly on X, which is delta hyperbolic and proper um, with induced action on um, the boundary being geometrically finite and if you're not familiar with that, I'll say something about what that means in a second. Um, so if P is a collection of uh, conjugacy reps maximal parabolics, then we say that GP is relatively hyperbolic. So in the case of sort of you have a group and the cusp space is one way that you could sort of construct this such a space, but you can do this sort of more generally. Um, downside that you should be aware of. So, so the plus is that this is a proper hyperbolic space and so you get some canonical notion of boundary called the Bowditch boundary out of it. And that's wonderful. The problem is, is that while the boundary is canonical up to homeomorphism, the actual underlying space X that produces the boundary for you may not be. So, so X is not necessarily not necessarily canonical up to say even reasonable notions like quasi isometry. So really primitive example of how you could do this is if you saw in the cusp space combinatorial horrible construction, I sort of introduced a distortion of two to the i into the metric by sort of adding edges when the distance between things are less than two to the i. But if you change that distortion, if you change that to three to the i, I think you can prove that that still gives you something that's quasi isometric, but you could change, make the distortion a lot bigger, like orders of magnitude bigger, like make it say, two to the two to the i, 
and now you produce a space that's even more distorted, it'll still give you something that's hyperbolic, but the distortion will be more extreme. So you lose sort of quasi isometry between that version of the cusp space and the version of the cusp space with the more extreme distortion. So you should be aware of that. Hold on one second, my phone has just gone absolutely bonkers here. So I'll put it on silent, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so geometrically finite, um, I should say, since this is an introductory talk, I should talk just a little bit about what that means. What, what this means is that, that um, what this means is that the, every point in the boundary should either be should be a conical limit point, which I'll leave there for a second, or two bounded parabolic. So conical limit point means you have some sort of north-south dynamics. So, so let's say this conical limit point, let's say this Q is in DX is conical limit point if what should happen is that um, there exists a uh, sequence of GI in G and X naught and X one. So GI Q is going to go to X naught while sort of GI Q prime goes to X one where Q is not equal to Q prime. So basically you have this special point that's going to be pushed in by your sequence so, and then you're going to have sort of everything else is repelled away by, by the sequence of elements. Or what you're going to have is you're going to have this bounded parabolic where this is, there's some Q where Q equals stab Q. Uh, this is the unique stabilizer of this, or yeah, this is the, so Q is going to be the stabilizer and what you want it to do and Q should act co-compactly on Q, on the boundary without Q. So you have this point that's stabilized but sort of everything else gets very mixed up by the stabilizer at this point. So the sort of canonical example that you should think of for this is this sort of if you take if you take a finite volume hyperbolic three manifold, it's going to be hyperbolic relative to its cusp subgroups. And you can sort of fill in the cusps at the universal cover level, you can fill in the cusps or you build this cusp space. And there are many different ways you can come to this perspective. But what you should get once you sort of cone off the cusps or whatever is you get something that looks like H3, which is the universal cover of such a thick manifold. All right, so that's just another way that you could get a useful notion of boundary. And now I'm going to switch gears a little and talk um, a bit more about some specialized machinery that I hope to use next week. And I'll go through again next week, but I wanted to, to introduce this. So one interesting theorem um, that's out there for how you can work on this and sort of the motivation that I want to introduce for this is, well, you have this boundary and you have this nice this nice proper action on the space that's proper, why would you go back to the other perspective? And here's one reason why you might want to sort of be able to go between perspectives, albeit the fact that it's kind of painful. This is a theorem due to Charney and Chris. So let's take a finitely generated G and it's going to act on X twiddle by isometries. And, um, which are, I want this to be properly discontinuous. And I just need X twiddle, this just needs to be a length space. But what we get is that then X twiddle is quasi-isometric to the coned off Cayley graph. 
rel the finite collection. of maximal isotropy subgroups in G. So you can kind of think of this as a relatively hyperbolic version of Milner and Schwartz and if you of the Milner Schwartz lemma. And if you you're sort of now relating if you can build this action and you get some some nice action on the cone off Cayley graph. But unfortunately, there may be situations where you can build this action, but you kind of want to be able to transfer what you know to saying things about this canonical boundary when you have this proper hyperbolic space. So unfortunately, this is not easy, but you can kind of go between them in a, in a sort of semi-reasonable manner between coned off. Sorry, what what is the if uh, there are no assumption, no other assumptions in this theorem? I think not. Um, you just any proper action by isometries. Any proper action by isometries, properly continuous, discontinuous. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should say that this is so. This should be an action by isometries is properly discontinuous, and I want to be co-compact. My bad. Okay. And, and uh, you assume that G is uh, G is relatively hyperbolic, or just that it's finitely generated. It's uh, it will be relatively hyperbolic relative the to the maximal isotropy subgroups. Um, Sorry, what do you mean by maximal? What are the isotropy subgroups uh, the, in this the, context? The stabilizers of points. Yeah. Okay. So should you get uh, like one representative for every conjugacy class of isotropy subgroups, right? You shouldn't take all of them. Yeah, that's right. That, yeah, that's right. Okay. So but yeah. Still, I, how I, how would you I how should... can you get finitely many? Like, how can you be sure that you get finitely many? Um, I think that's a that's content of the theorem that I couldn't exactly tell you at, <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yeah. If you if you're interested in this, this is in. Um, let me tell you the exact reference. This is uh, from relative hyperbolicity and art and groups uh, by Charney and Crisp. It's uh, 2007. Thank you. Is X tilde is, is meant to be hyperbolic or just any length space? I, I think you're right. <laughs> Yeah, I want it to okay. be, yeah, if I should say, yeah. Hmm. Okay, well now this just looks like the Milner Schwartz lemma should say that G is actually hyperbolic so be nose, a right? so be a properly discontinuous action, but it may not actually be a, a proper space. It should I should say oh. it's, it's a. I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. I totally botched the I botched the hypothesis. It should be discontinuous and discontinuous and co-compact, but not necessarily proper. So ah. next week, next week I'll have an example of where we construct a natural. I'll give a natural example of how you can construct such an action on a cat zero cube complex, and this is where where this will sort of come in is that we'll be able to, to sort of, you know, here's this here's this relatively hyperbolic group, and then if you can satisfy these conditions, you get an action nice action on a cat zero cube complex, but you can interact naturally with the relatively hyperbolic geometry through the cone off Cayley graph. And what is, can you just tell us what discontinuous means without the word properly in front of it? Good question. What exactly do I mean by that? Um, what I don't want is I don't want sort of, 
what exactly do I not want to have happen other than that it doesn't happen when I care about it. Is, is this going to be some kind of distinction between like compact sets and bounded sets? Like that because the space is not necessarily proper. So yeah, that, that sounds roughly right. I think it would probably be wise if we held that question and I'll think about it in the meantime. And because we'll, we'll come back to this, this theorem will figure prominently next week. Okay. Better that I don't make things up on the spot. <laughs> okay, so I've got a couple more minutes. So I guess the, the point of what I want to get through between, between the Kondoff Cayley graph and this notion of boundary, we want to know how can we go between that? And one of the unfortunate, unfortunate fact is that the, the visual boundary of the Kondoff Cayley graph is not enough. So you're kind of, if you have one of these actions on your proper cusp space and you take its boundary, you should get a point on the cusp space. You should get one point for each of these cosets that you've added the combinatorial horribles to, or you should get sort of the, for each of the cone points when you cone off, you should get a peripheral point in your boundary of the proper hyperbolic space that you act on. So, um, So how to do this, so what you do is you take you take the visual boundary of the Cayley graph plus what you need to do is you need to throw in um, one point for each GP. So basically throw in one point for each of the peripheral cosets and those are going to be your um, peripheral points. And now you need to at least get some kind of, and now you need to get some kind of topology on this and what the topology is. So say we have some we have sort of my Kodoff Cayley graph picture and you have some sequence of rays and they're gonna go through here and then they come up in the cone point and leave and here's another, and then it goes out to the boundary. So I guess what we should do is pretend here's my base point X naught and then pick a different color for here's the boundary and you go out to the boundary and we take a bunch of these different rays and they sort of, you can imagine they come through the cone point in this way, and you could have other things that go through the cone point. But what you really want to get is you get a sequence, a sequence converges to the cone point when the, the Cayley graph distance spent in the cone point goes to infinity. So what do I mean by that? So you could imagine that each time you go through this cone point to go from in one of those flats that we saw in the tree of flats to go from any point on that flat through the cone point that's distance two in the coned off distance. But of course, you could, there's a, another notion of distance on that flat, which is the actual distance in the flat without the cone point and a sequence will converge when a sequence of rays will converge to that particular parabolic or cone point exactly when the amount of time that it takes them to travel through the particular flat will go to infinity. And this is how you go between sort of the conception of the visual boundary and the geometry of the relatively coned off or the geometry of the coned off Cayley graph and how you can link it to this canonical boundary. So I have about four minutes left. So I think I'll just say one, 
additional thing of how about how this sort of relates to cube complexes and we'll handle the the cube complexes in more detail next week um, but let me, let me introduce this this one theorem for Roshan and Wise. And I should note that this, so if you want a full account of this, this construction, you can look at it in Bowditch's paper, very long paper on relatively hyperbolic groups, gives it a, an account that uh, if you stare at it long enough, you'll eventually decipher what's going on. So a theorem due to Bergeron Weiss is suppose we have a group that's hyperbolic And suppose we have a collection W of quasi-convex. So basically subgroups that play nicely with the geometry. And what we want is here's my sort of crude picture of my group. And we have some, some boundary for the group. And what happens is we take two points, U and V in the boundary. And what we want is we want to have some group that's co-dimension one in the sense that, that what it's going to do for all U and V in the boundary, there exists some H in this collection of W so that if I take the boundary and I cut out the limit points of this particular nice quasi-convex subgroups, it separates these two elements into H distinct components. So meaning that you can't permute the, you can't go between the components by the action of your subgroup as well. Uh, then G is going to act properly and co-compactly on a cat zero cube complex. So if you're familiar with cat zero cube complexes, great. If you're not, I'll talk more about them next week, but sort of the, the moral that you can hold on to for now is that acting on a properly and co-compactly on a cat zero cube complex when you're hyperbolic is really awesome because you get this virtual specialness property. It was used by Wise extensively and then Agle to prove the virtual Hawking conjecture. So you can do some really cool stuff when you can construct such an action. And so next week, what I'll do is we'll sort of introduce a new way to construct actions of relatively hyperbolic groups on cube complexes will show that some sort of similar construction applies when you can split this canonical Bowditch relatively hyperbolic boundary of the, the cusp space. And we'll sort of see how we can do useful things with that. And we can hope to kind of try to build similar structure theorems that you would get for hyperbolic groups for these relatively hyperbolic groups that act and we'll build nice actions of them on cat zero cube complexes and hopefully try to retrieve a lot of the machinery. So that's, I guess, a bit of an advertisement for what I'll talk about next week. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Andy and uh, follow up with questions. Just a naive question to make sure about the last statement. Uh, uh, how does the group H separate the point U and V? Is that boundary G minus? Uh, without the limit set, sorry. Oh, the limit set. Okay. I, I okay, okay. squashed my lambda there. Okay, so you take out the limit set of uh, the subgroup H and you hope U and V lie in different components? Is right. That... Okay, right. yeah. So like the really simple example you should think of is like if you take if you take a cat if you already have a cat zero cube complex and you take one of the hyperplanes in the cat zero cube complex it's going to basically slice your boundary into sort of nice distinct pieces and that that's sort of if you're already in that situation great but if not if you can sort of produce these subgroups that act kind of like hyperplanes this gives you a natural way to kind of build the action around and tells you what the hyperplane structure of the cube complex should be which actually tells you everything you need to know about your cat zero cube complex.
Okay. So thank that's you. sort of that's sort cool. of the idea. But yeah, the, the sort of material, here, the meat of this is that when you do this in this way with relatively minimal conditions, you get something that's proper and co-compact. And when you're in the relatively hyperbolic situation, it's not necessarily so obvious that you're going to get something that's proper and co-compact. In fact, you, you won't. <laughs> and you try to compensate for this. Uh, sorry, let me follow up on another question on this statement. Um, does this so if you have a hyperbolic group whose boundary is uh, totally disconnected, like the, the basically there is nothing to that you need to do, right? I mean, there or U and V already lie in two diff distinct connected components. So th is this telling you that every hyperbolic group with a totally disconnected boundary is cat zero cubicle? I think you need to get. The problem is you still need to come up with this ample, you need an ample supply of these quasi-convex subgroups, right? It's not just that the, the point that the boundary points are separated, it, the, the sort of tricky part of the statement is actually being able to produce a substantial supply of these quasi-convex subgroups so that you have something to build a cat zero cube you know, sort of these will be the hyper, these quasi-convex subgroups, once you do this construction due to Sagiv, they're going to be the hyperplane stabilizers of the cat zero cube mm -hmm. complex you get. So you have to, not only do you need to assure that like you have these totally disconnected points, but you need to make sure that there's actually a quasi-convex subgroup that, right, okay, that yeah. separates them. Okay, so you like this collect, like they, there should be actually limit points that you're taking out. Yeah, you, I guess you cannot, so. Yeah, you cannot have like W being just the trivial group. Yeah, I mean, I guess yeah. the the thing should be that like, yeah, you it's easy to separate the points, but whether there's some yeah some quasi convex subgroup that's going to separate them, that that's another question. All right, thanks. All right, any more? Uh... Oh, sorry, I was just wondering, could you not just take your favorite infinite order element and then look at the Z generated by that to do the trick, if you were in this case? Yeah, I guess that does seem right, doesn't it? I guess I, I'll add that to my homework to make sure <laughs> to think about it. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, if not, let's thank Teddy again. Um, yeah. All right, well, thanks again uh, for inviting talk, uh, me. Yeah. And uh, you'll have to listen to me again next week. So <laughs> don't get too excited that you're rid of me yet. <laughs> That's good. See you next week. Yep. See you next week. Thank you Thanks. for the talk. Yeah. Yep. Take care. Bye.